And now on Public Occurrences, I'm talking to Ray and Lucy, the founders of the 5 Responders. How are you guys doing today? Doing fantastic. Doing, yeah, doing well. Thank you. I have to excuse us operating on two conversations. We interrupt each other constantly. It's part of our shtick. Well, that, that's absolutely fine. <laughs> uh, so before I get to my first question, I just want to address the, the wee elephant in the room. Where might we have heard your voice before, Lucy? Uh, I am on the Modus Files, there, where I play Lilith. And I am on Once Upon a Wasteland, where I play Amanda Otis. And I'm also on the Chad podcast, like Ray is as well where I play Corey Anders, one of the responders in the podcast, as well as Old Lady Simpson. It sounds like you both have a bit more experience than I do then. Um, <laughs> what, what about you, Ray? Do we hear you anywhere else? Chad, the Fallout 76 podcast is really where we both got our start. I voice Commander Johns there. I also, in our personal group, do Commander Johns and Dutch Walker. I've done some Small voices for a uranium fever, just some some ad on characters there, nothing long term. I think, you know, I've done something for Modus File, again, just filler spots. So I'm not quite the same level of voice dynamics as Lucy is, that's for sure. <laughs> but it's been fun. It's been fun. It certainly sounds like fun. And those are both all fantastic shows there. Make sure that you check them out yeah, after they really listening are. to us if you haven't already. So the first real question I like to ask everyone is, what was your first Fallout moment? I didn't get introduced to Fallout until Fallout 3. And Ray was like, hey, you should try this game. And I was like, all right. And I fell in love with it. I think because it was so close to home, given its location, we live in the same area where Fallout 3 takes place. So for us, at least for me, it was just kind of an interesting personal experience. And so that's kind of where I got introduced into Fallout. So Fallout 3... Fallout 4, and then 76. I have a confession that I have not played New Vegas. <laughs> mm-hmm. Although I have watched people play it. So I'm kind of like, uh, I've watched people play it, so I'm not going to play it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a shame. That's a shame. I got to start on Fallout with the original Fallout back in 97. I was in college, and I really hadn't done much gaming since the late 80s and Super Nintendo, but uh, my buddy had a pretty nice computer system at the time, and we were roommates, and he started playing it, and I was looking over his shoulder, and I'm like, what in the world is this? I think for me, the allure of Fallout, the first one and the series thereafter, is that one in particular was so non-linear, and games up to that point were really, you know, kind of a check and go, check and go, sort of go here, go there, but that one was just such a visceral, uh, wide open experience, and the storytelling and at the time, just the the game style, you know, kind of over the top, looking down, and it was a captivating, captivating story and a captivating game at the time. But I, I would say, that moment we all walk out of the vault and Fallout Three, that I think that that is the one that cemented the love for that. But my favorite is Vegas by far. I like the uh, hyper loneliness feel to that one, but also just the uh, genre of the 1950s Vegas style feel. And really all of the survivability factor in that game was very appealing. So having to upgrade and upkeep your weapons and things like that. Um, that's a really interesting contrast between the two of you there. Yeah, yeah. it's just a story to tell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the funny thing is she she is really the role player. You know, like if I had to look back on our experiences and the way Fallout is sort of that role play experience or the, that type of gaming I mean, Lucy has a lot of experience with MMOs and things like that. I'm sure she can talk to you about, but yeah, it is a funny dynamic. I seem to get into these games and then pull her in that direction. And then she just, boom, you know, it explodes and she goes gung ho. That, that's amazing. So I've been following your social media for a little while now, and I can see you do both role plays as well as make your own in-game movies. How exactly does that work? Do you role play the same characters in the films and have extras fill other parts? Or do you double up on roles or how does it work? Yeah, it's quite a production, that's for sure. It really starts with Lucy. She has the formula. So usually I have a story arc in mind with X amount of chapters or stages. And I kind of outline it out, and some of it requires in-game RP, where our characters in the group that we play with, they all have choices to make and face certain obstacles, and the results of those interactions end up actually fueling 
the next chapter, what happens next. So every encounter, every role play that we have set up, one of these official ones, has rewards and consequences. So based off of their choices that they make, it's just exactly like kind of like DMing an event. It fuels where I take the next chapter in a more specific direction. And then I will go to Ray and I'll say, this is this is the story arc. This is what we're doing. This is how it ties to our lore or how it ties to, you know, another group or whatever it might be. Can you help me kind of put this to a visual? And that's where the machinima comes in. And so he'll say, okay, let's sit down and look at the planning for this. Let's storyboard it out. What are the key factors? What are the angles I need? And so it's, it's a process that we do together. We spend time at our kitchen bar often talking about the staging and what we would want to see the end product kind of look like in order to tell the story. When it comes to the larger machinima, he and I will discuss kind of the story, the the overarching story, like our big, our big machinima pieces, the ones that are almost an hour in length. And I'll create the script, I'll write it out, it'll go through several revisions and edits, and then I punt it to him, and then he sits down and he starts to storyboard it. And many of our players are the characters that you see in the machinima. So our characters also appear in the machinima stories that we're telling. And sometimes they do double up. Sometimes we we play multiple characters, but we try to keep it as limited to one identifiable character at a time. So just because I might change the clothes or the look of one of my characters in the game, you will only see me playing one specific character and voicing that one specific character in the machinima. It just makes it easier that way. So that's how we end up with a cast of over 40 people (laughs) and that's just voice actors that doesn't even mean the amount of bodies that we actually move around that is our current situation but the background from how it all started really was our interactions in game like lucy was saying and we started to feel like we wanted to have a summary of the events and tell the story in a little bit more of a cinematic way and that's how the machinima sort of came to play was it was more like the lore building so you know when when you play a video game you have that entry story that you watch before you hit start when it kind of pulls you into the world you're about to play in that's what the videos do this is the general story that's going to be happening and introduce the characters if we had to sum it up it's basically a podcast with visuals of course but but it's happening real time as well. So our characters, when they become part of our group, they take on the role of their character, both in the game and in written RP. And then the big story, like Lucy was saying, the big story arcs and their interactions within it, we try to document or summarize what's happening. So it became more for our community just to have that fun visual. But then it did start to appeal to the outside community. And that's where we have morphed to this point a hybrid of role play with storytelling you mentioned outside community there a few weeks ago we spoke to the wasteland theater company who mentioned that you've been helping them with setting up shows what other groups Mm -hmm. that you're working with and how is it all the theater company is our first long-term i call it production where we're sort of in the background helping to bring that content to the masses but in the past we have worked with many factions to tell our grander story so for example the trial of the warlord is probably it is our biggest story arc for the last three and a half years it has involved many outside factions representing enclave and raiders and bos so those groups we have brought into the mix and they help us tell the stories as well but the theater company that's our first foray into really helping another group bring their material to a larger audience i don't know if lucy has anything to add to that i would just say that because we've been around since the beginning we do have several long-term relationships with different groups different people through the game and Anytime we're taking a story in a particular direction, we invite people to kind of think about what's realistic, what's their story, because we want to also help tell the stories of other people. So when it comes to some of our machinima, it isn't always just the giant big movie production. Sometimes it really is just let us help you tell your story. And we've done these little shorts, these machina lore is what we call them, these little shorts where they focus in on a character or or a section of the community. And then we take that even further with the responders undercover where we interview particular groups in the PlayStation community and talk about what they were doing and how they were playing the game and enjoying the game, whether they were 
uranium fever or virtual photography, we kind of focused on spending time interviewing them and discussing also how they were working. That's part of the streaming is something the last year that we have really playing with. We're not, I wouldn't call us weekly streamers by any stretch. We've always visualized ourselves as more of a studio. So when, when it comes to streaming, we definitely are reaching out to other communities. And I hope anyone that's listening to this, if you have an RP community or an interesting role play style story to tell, we are looking to promote those groups. One of the things that we are looking to do over the next year is utilize, like Lucy was saying, Responders Undercover, which is where we interview outside groups to learn their stories, their, their lore, their role play in particular, not like builds and things like that. It, it sounds like what you're doing requires a lot of work. What process do you go through with these projects? How long do they take to develop and what tools are you using to do it? So if we're, if we're breaking our group down into three zones, we have our role play community and our just in-game community. That's our Fallout 5.0 faction. And then the Fallout production side, focusing more on our content creation, streaming, machinima. And then we have sort of our Discord side, which is storytelling only in writing, generally. I'll speak on the content creation part, so Fallout Productions. That definitely, it's it's a process. I'm not a professional TV director, so I kind of call it guerrilla machinima or guerrilla production. You know, it's it's kind of duct taped together. But it starts with the fundamental idea, and whether it's interviewing another community or it's telling a machinima, it really just starts with, can we give the information to the audience as pure as possible? So one of the things I admire about the 76 Theater, for example, is when we started working with them, they were very much, Northern in particular, Northern Harvest, was very much against a lot of flashy streaming you know didn't want tons of overlays we just wanted to deliver the content and that's i think something we relate to as well so when we sit down to plan things out it always starts with just how do we deliver this great story to the audience without distracting them and diluting it with a lot of other stuff so the planning process it just starts there and then it expands into only the necessities what information do we need to deliver so from the machinima standpoint we always take the story that uh, either lucy has written or that the community has formed in our role play and then we storyboard it out so literally i will spend you know probably an enormous amount of hours that I don't need to do if you speak to other machinima artists. But I like to see the story on a storyboard first. So I will write out the angles, the dialogue that is next to it, what I'm trying to relay and the emotion. You know, Fallout is not exactly a play. It is a great machinima place. But, you know, when you don't have moving mouths and things like that, it's very difficult to get emotion and expression. And so we have to take time to learn what emojis and camera mode, facial expressions and poses. So it, it takes a lot of time just to do that part of it. And then, as you know, the editing process, when we're talking about machinima, it's not just putting together the pieces of the video, but it's also sound editing. It's voiceover work. You have to get the actors to send in their lines. You're piecing and placing the lines and pacing and background music. And you know, so it, it becomes a, a real production. So from a production side, it's everything you might imagine it to be. So Lucy, what about the community side of things? So where do I begin? <laughs> yeah, on a, on Discord, uh, there is a lot of writing that happens. Sometimes it is unplanned sort of experiences where a writer will set up a scene or a situation with their character and just run with it and see who jumps on it. And other times I will, or one of my established other writers will, set up a, a large event on the Discord where people have an opportunity to play through in text role play the events. And so in order to get that to happen, there is some backward planning that, that obviously needs to occur ahead of time. So I spend some time in the game and in different resources trying to establish locations or specific static things in the game that are that can serve a purpose. For example, if I'm doing an event where I need the people to travel from one place to another, I need to be able to have reference points in the game that make sense. And that can be for either text RP or in the game RP. So I spend a lot of time in the game actually running around the map and trying to find areas that aren't necessarily listed 
or objects that are, are static and not going to disappear from somebody picking it up or whatever. And I, and I use those and those become these assets that we then incorporate. So some of the planning time is spent in that. When it comes to writing the scripts, the screenplays for the different pieces that he ends up filming, it depends on the subject matter and whether it's a long chapter or it's a, just a, a machine of short, like a, something very small that you know I can whip out in a day. But the process does involve looking at the game, looking at the assets in the game, what's realistic, what I can use to my advantage to help tell the story, the environment, or even NPCs in the game, and then getting it down on on paper in some fashion and having it go through a revision process. Because I'm not a screenwriter by trade. I am more of a narrative writer. And so I really had to learn over the years how to rethink writing in terms of storytelling when it comes to the movie format. You can't have long, drawn-out speeches, and you're limited by, like what Ray said, characters not being able to have their mouths move. So I really had to rely on how much information I could deliver in short bursts of dialogue or save it for, save the longer pieces for text-based writing back and forth with the community in order to facilitate their movement through a particular narrative arc. To summarize so that it makes a little more sense, the whole process starts in the community. So we start with writing generally. This is what going on in the game on the Discord. And then we take what storytelling is happening in the Discord and we take it into the game world. And then players will interact knowing sort of the background story that has been written. And they will go in and they will play out the rest of the story take what they play out we bring it into screenwriting and we take what they do and we make it screenable and then we will film the major story portions of that and turn it into machina lore and then put it out so that's how it works we write it they go in they play it we take their results from their playing we turn it into a machina lore and then put it out as a story. Those are the the basic steps that happen. Now, in between that, there's a million other little things, but those are the four primaries. Story, gameplay, screenplay, and machinima. It sounds almost like a full-time job. Uh, when you've been <laughs> yes, around... You have no idea. Yeah. But when you've been running around the map, have there been any particular finds that you've been particularly surprised to find and do you use any mm. particular tools to find them i yeah, like the I'll, holotapes yeah yeah i was gonna yeah I'll, I'll i don't mean to cut you off exactly what she just said the holotapes absolutely there's so much story in this game and so many points of reference that can be used to tell more stories go ahead Lucy. didn't mean to cut you no no that's fine I Yeah, I spent a lot of time trying to listen to holotapes that are in really obscure places, caves, trailers, wherever you find them, to get an idea of what happened there. And same thing with the terminals, just spending time reading some of the terminal entries. And you're like, hey, this is a story that they just wrote for like a little drop for somebody that's reading the terminal, but we could do something right. with this. We could take this and actually tell the story of what happened here that led up to this point. And, so and I don't know if I've just been... Go ahead. As I was going to say, it's an amazing thing to find those because a lot of times they have trail story as well. So if you look at the base that you just read or heard, and then you can actually find other portions of that story too. So it's just such depth in the game where, where that's concerned. Go ahead. I think also I'm never really surprised so much by things that I've found in the game, more just like, oh, wow, that was, was kind of neat to find that. I find them interesting and a little bit of you know the easter eggs i I think their their connection to pop culture is always funny when i see that happen like the tea party for example the mad hatter's tea party i just i kind of giggle every time i stumble across that again and again and again in the world because it's just funny and very kind of a, a nod to the bigger picture of the world that was left behind and and some of the pop culture references. But when in doubt, I also Google things. <laughs> I Google foo things and try to figure out where is that one place where the the weird mysterious pillars are? And then to actually find those mysterious pillars 
And then I had no idea they were actually real somewhere down south in Georgia, I think. So they're actually real pillars, except they just got torn down apparently over the summer. But that was kind of, that's, I guess, the closest thing to a surprise was that these mysterious pillars that appear in 76 are actual real things down the south. Yeah. There's certainly a lot to find there. But if there's just one piece of advice you could give an aspiring Fallout content creator, what would it be? I got to work through which one. <laughs> <laughs> one piece of advice, whatever you want to create, make sure it's something that you're interested in and not what you think other people would be interested in. Because otherwise then it becomes a job, you know, and you want your whatever you're creating to be something that you have a passion for. So make it something that you have a connection to, but also understand that it does take time it does take patience and you have to be willing to accept that there will be some sacrifice of time in order to to create whatever it is that you're trying to create and that can be somewhat difficult for people when they kind of realize the amount of time it may take to bring to fruition whatever their vision might be i certainly hear you there yeah. If you're out there and you haven't tried this, however long you think it takes to edit something, you're yeah. wrong. <laughs> yeah, I want to echo exactly what Lucy said, and that is create for you and your people. The the group, or if it's just you, just create content you want to create. We've never been trying to market our material. It was never about that. We love it if people enjoy the storytelling and the machinima. But I'm sure you've edited something and you think it's brilliant and then it falls flat or you're just like, wow, why isn't there more views or why aren't there more listens? But the reality is if you enjoy what you're creating, that is the most important part. And don't get caught up in whether or not others are liking the material. It's something you're doing for you. They say, especially in the machinima world, create machinima that appeals to the fan base that you are making the machinima in. And uh, I will say over the years, we, we've done exactly the opposite of that. So we're telling our character stories. And if you're not part of our community, you probably aren't really invested in those characters, but we are. And, and so that's what makes it fun. And that's why we still continue to do it. And it's because it means something to us. So create something that means something to you and you'll eventually find your people that enjoy it. Right. You're right, no, though. The editing process is, is, is hellish. <laughs> so we're recording this at the start of October 2022, and I understand you're both working on something special at the moment. Can you tell me more about it? Yeah, there's actually quite a few things. I'll throw out right away the 25th anniversary Fallout cosplay. I can't speak enough about how awesome these events are going to be over four cities. We have Vegas and West Virginia, Austin, and we are hosting in D.C., and it uh, was put together for the Fallout for Hope to benefit St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. And so not only is it an amazing celebration of a game we've all loved for a generation, but it's an amazing opportunity to provide some charitable support to that organization. And definitely want to shout out Kenny over at Chad Fallout 76, who really, he is Fallout for Hope in that group. And yeah, they have done such amazing work over the years to take this game that we all love to make it something more than just a game. But that's the biggest thing happening in October. Luce, do you want to mention the theater production too? That's right. going to be epic for Fallout. Yeah, we have the well. theater production on October 15th. We're doing a Midsummer Night's Dream. And we'll be performing that in the game live, and we'll be streaming that. And that will be at 7 p.m. Eastern on the 15th. Yeah, I'm excited. I, I'm playing a character in it. One of my favorite characters, actually. I'm playing Nick Bottom. I adore that character. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the play is just, uh, I can't say enough about that. I just really want to shout that out too, because it is, you can almost smell the high school theater. You know what I mean? Like, so when you're watching it or as I'm streaming it and I'm just watching it, it just feels very real. It's a very real play, you know? So the dynamic there with the game being utilized for that's amazing. So I hope everyone will definitely tune into that. We are also streaming that for Fallout for Hope. So if you want to give whatever you can spare to to help and and tune into that that's on twitch.tv fallout five zero so that's f-i-v-e zero number zero on twitch that's really great to hear that you're part of that we've been excited for it since we spoke to northern harvest last month there what platforms are you on how big is your group at the moment 
We started on PlayStation. We're heavily entrenched on PlayStation, but we have also started to develop our community also on the Xbox side. We're yeah, not PC players. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we can only do two at a time. Okay. Yeah, so Xbox is our newest. Great. And now moving to the social media, what are the best ways to follow up what you're doing and connect with you? The central source would just be Fallout 5.0. So Fallout, F-I-V-E zero.com. That has all of our socials listed, but we're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I really haven't figured out TikTok yet. I'm a little, little probably. Uh, we'll but, stay away from TikTok. Uh, right. And you, and <laughs> YouTube, that's where we post most of our longer videos. Twitter is where we will have our shorts generally. Instagram, again, still figuring that out. And Facebook was where we started. Connecting is all easy from one source, and that's fallout50.com. Great. Well, thanks very much for joining us. And I'm looking forward to seeing more releases from you, uh, as well as uh, watching along with Midsummer Night Stream there in a couple of weeks. Very appreciative of you having us on. Thank, Thank you, you for having much. us. Yes, really appreciate it. Yeah, really enjoying the shows that you're putting out as well. So keep at it. Thank you. Thank you.